I'm Mark Olson, the Los Angeles Times. For this edition of the Envelope Screening Series, we talk with actor Clay's Bang, star of writer-director Ruben Oslin's The Square. The movie is a piercing satire of the art world and an uproarious and timely exploration of power and the fragility of the male psyche. The film won the top prize at this year's Cannes Film Festival, The Palm d'Or, and is Sweden's entry to the Foreign Language Academy Award. I saw online the press conference for the film from the Cannes Film Festival when it premiered, and you mentioned there that the director, Ruben Ostland, he said that he wanted every day to end with the actors having no dignity left. That's what, that's, uh, that's right. He said, nobody leaves the set today with any kind of dignity. That's true. And what was that like? like how, what does that do for you as a performer? Well, I didn't take it too seriously. Um, I didn't <laughs> take it too personally. But I think what he meant was that he, what Ruben really wants is to turn you inside out, right? And and he would he wants to sort of strip you of any kind of um, any kind of acting, any kind of will, any kind. Of, he he just wants to get at what is authentic and organic and truthful, and and it's not so. It's probably when you hear those words, it sounds worse than it is. Uh, but I, I I think that for every scene, he sort of creates this dilemma for all the characters, and that's what he means, I think, when he. You, you sort of get yourself in a position where you can't really make the right choice. You can only do this or that, and this is terrible, and that is even worse. So um, uh, I suppose that's what he means in a way, yeah. And I, I want to ask you about your career sort of up until now. I think for most American audiences, this film is going to be the first they're, they're seeing. Probably, you. right, yeah. It, but you've worked extensively in Denmark in film and television and in the theater. What, wh how have you kind of felt about your career up until now? Do you feel like you've been kind of waiting for a role like this or a moment like this? Well, I don't think you can actually wait for something like this. It, it just dawned, it just happened, fell down my turban somehow. Um, I, I'm f***ing pretty pleased with my career. I've done so many great things, but you know, to do something like this was something that I never expected. And I've said this probably a million times, but with this thing, I just got to drive the Ferrari of my profession because the way he works and this role and the time and space that he allows you to sort of really investigate and explore every direction and every dimension of, of, of the situation and the character has just been amazing. So, if someone 20 years had asked me, what, 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 what is your dream? I would probably, if I could have said it, I, I would have said this. And now tell me a little bit about the casting process. I understand it took a little time for you to actually get, you know, after meeting with Ruben to actually get the role. What was that process like? Well, he's quite thorough, right? Um, um, so I think we went through three casting sessions and they were all sort of like three hours long. Um, and actually, I didn't read the script till after I got the part, because he didn't allow anyone to read the script beforehand. And for the first casting, I was asked to write and do the speech that I do in the, muse in the museum, introducing the art exhibition. And um, I got to the casting, and uh, he sat me down, and he talked me through the whole film, and we did improvs of something like six, seven scenes. And then I was just about to leave, but he was about to send me on my way, and I said, listen, I've actually written this speech, and should I do it? Uh, and then I did it. And what is interesting about that is afterwards, uh, he said to me that, um, that at that point where I say, my father just died, can you just talk to me for half an hour? Because I've got no one to talk to. That sort of flipped it for him, turned it. So that was a quite good thing that I insisted on doing it, because he was about to send me on my way. Well, tell me about sort of like your version of that speech, writing that speech. What kind of instructions had he given you, and how did you kind of almost none? Out? I just, I just, he just, I just knew that this is a square, four by four meters um, uh, of sanctuary and and caring and everything. And I was just asked to do whatever I felt was right for it. So I just came up with that thing, you know, is look down and you just find yourself standing in a square and you can just ask anybody for help you can ask anyone can you please watch my dog while i go shopping and can you t teach me to swim or 
can you talk to me for half an hour? Because my father just, I, I just came up with that and, and we kept it in the film, yeah. So I think he actually, he must have liked it at some, s somehow, yeah. And so then once you actually read the script, I mean, the film is, deals with a lot of issues. There's, a, there's like a lot going on in this movie. It deals with sort of, I know Ruben talks about sort of social contracts. It deals with class. It deals with sort of male privilege and sort of the privilege of power. Where do you start with all that? Like, how do you kind of come up with your performance? Well, in that sense, Ruben never ever, he never talks about character. He never talks about background. He never talks about psychology. He never talks about, I mean, as an actor, I don't think you can actually play the themes of the film or the sort of bigger picture. You can actually just do what is in the situation right now. And that's what he's all about, you know, being in that in that moment. I mean, you're in you're you're at work and, and someone that you slept with a couple of nights ago comes up to you and says, So what are we gonna do now? Please relate to that. Um so that's how every day actually was. He's not he's not he's not ever asking you to sort of I mean, it's it's when you fit all these bits and pieces together that you get the whole picture. Um and I actually allow myself the luxury of you know just losing my mind in that sense and just being there is that what that's what he wanted so that's what i did yeah and now the character of christian do you like him like what like what do you make of him as a as a person i love him <laughs> i love him there's so much of christian there's so much of me in christian so if i said i hated him it would be terrible to be me um, no, well, what I mean by that is that Ruben actually, I hate to say this because it's almost admitting that I'm doing no acting in this film, I'm just being me, um, and that's a terrible thing to say, but um, what he wants is that you try to be as truthful and authentic to the situation as you can be. And I actually think that I drew on a lot of things that are inside me for this thing. And that's what he wants. He wants that sort of really organic feel to it. So I, I can't say that even if Christian comes across as an as a jerk and an idiot or something, I probably think that I can relate to everything that he does in the film. And also the stupid stuff that he does. Because, I mean, the stupid stuff that he does in the film is like things that he does when he's like really under pressure. I mean... That thing with the guy in the staircase, he's had a very bad day at work that day, right? He's been sacked. He's, there's been this video. He's been at this monkey dinner. He's been the worst day at work ever. And obviously, if there's a kid in your staircase saying, you need to apologize, you'll go, go f yourself. Get the f out of my face. Um, yeah, I don't know. But I, 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 I actually think that if you could ask Christian, he would probably say that I'm, I'm sort of a decent, good-hearted person. I would, I'm not a bad person. And, I mean, he actually stops in the street to help this woman when she comes up. And then he's tricked and he's fooled. And if someone asks him for money, he says, well, I've got no change, but I could buy you food. And then she wants it without the onion. And that's sort of weird, but uh, still. <laughs> um, so I think, yeah. I can actually relate to everything he does, yeah. Well, I think that's one of the most remarkable things about your performance and in the movie is that even as you're watching him make what are these sort of obvious mistakes, you still very much sympathize with him. I think you can very much understand why he's doing what he's doing in the moment, even though like as a, a viewer, you sort of would hope that you yourself would not be making those same choices. Well, I very much appreciate that you say that because I don't think you could sit through a film that is this long if you thought he was like the worst person in the world. And I, I think you need to sympathize with him. And I, I actually think that is one of the only things that we talked about. I said to Ruben that I thought it was important that he was likable, that he was sympathetic. Um, because otherwise you would just sit there and you would just think, okay, you've got it coming and you deserved it. Um, but I think uh, in order for the film to work, I think it's quite important that at the end, when I see the film, I want C Christian to find the boy and, and just to make sure that he's all right. And you need that to sort of transport yourself. I mean, otherwise you couldn't sit through it. I don't think so. I know I, I, 
interviewed Ruben myself, and he told me really the only time the two of you had sort of a major disagreement was, That's a lie. <laughs> was shooting the press conference scene, and that the, it, you basically the two of you were arguing over how sympathetic and sort of genuine his yeah. apology should be. He terrorized me on that day, on those two days. I think what he, he really wanted me to be pushed into a corner, right? He wanted me, I mean, he wanted me to feel bad, or the character. And in order to get at that, he sort of had something like 40 of those people sitting in the crowd. They are actually real journalists, and they were just grilling me with all kinds of questions that I just couldn't answer, ever. Um, and, you know, when they sort of ask the same question, he does a lot of takes, right? So when he, when they'd asked the same questions like five times and I got quite good at answering them, he said, you can't say that anymore. You have to think of something else. And if I got too good at it, we started shouting at each other and, or he called me bad names and he, and I said to him, okay, listen, please, you don't get to say that in front of all these people. Come back with, come back to the corridor with me. And we had a very big fight out there. And then we went back in, and it was terrible. I could have <laughs> killed him on those days. <laughs> he was he was so mean and nasty to me. I really, really hated him. And I went to see my wife um, in Norway. She was on a shoot up there. Just after that, I had something like five days off, and I was just I was just I'm just gonna stay in Norway. And we were the worst place. Norway's terrible, let me tell you this. Norway's the worst. Um, I, I just wanted to stay in that little <laughs> village forever because I was like, I'm not ever going to see that guy again. I, I just really, I was so sick of him. And that was just midway through it. I, I, it was terrible, yeah. We're friends now. We're all right. We've talked about it. And now I'm, I'm interested in Ruben's process. I mean, he does do a lot of takes, like 70 some takes. That's average, yeah. yeah. And now do you know that going in and yeah. how do you adjust to that as like a working process? And let me just put, put it straight because it's, it's not, it's, it might sound like a terrible thing but it's not. It's like what is so fulfilling about this that you actually get that time and space and trust from your director to sort of explore this situation and go in that direction and th this direction and try this and this and that and everything. And that has been an amazing experience to sort of, I mean, he spends, all, I mean, there are very little money spent here on effects. He spends all his money on time on set with the actors to get into that very authentic, organic thing. And that's been so fulfilling. I mean, it's been amazing. Totally. And then, so, given how many takes you do, and I'm assuming what a sort of variety of performance you're giving him, is it then something of a surprise for you when you actually see the movie? Like, you don't necessarily know what performance it's been shaped into. No, that's true, actually. And that's, I mean, that's sort of the terror of doing film and television, because you do something, and, and they stick it on a reel, and then someone fits it together, and you've actually got no idea and with this one, it was like the worst. Um, but also very, I mean, to sort of allow yourself to just say, well, this is what he wants from me. He, he doesn't want me to sort of do the math of what this is film is going to be about. He's going to take care of it. OK, I'm going to just go with it and just do what he says and just do this thing. Just be here right now. I mean, this could be a scene from the film. And just stay with it and just be in it and not try to sort of be smart about it or or think of something brilliant to say but just be there and just um but in that I, I wasn't when i saw the first sort of edit of it and the, the first edit was like 3 hours and 35 minutes long um i wasn't really surprised at um, i mean it's not like it f sort of was a surprise in any way but still i was it is like you know sort of giving this piece to play with, and this piece to play with, and this piece, and then see, oh, God, oh, f the puzzle looks like this now. Um, but um, it wasn't like I was like, oh, f did we do this or that? Or No, no, absolutely not, no. And then I want to be sure to ask about your scenes with Eliz El Elizabeth Moss, that, I mean, there's something so funny, but really deeply uncomfortable in, in those scenes, 
I will I I will politely bypass asking you about this the actual sex scene. No, and, let's talk about that. <laughs> and the scene after like directly after as you're disposing of this condom for to it re- like it is such a funny scene, but it's first of all, what is going on in Christian's mind? What is he nervous about? Well, I think I suppose the the thing is that he's like is she going to have my kid now? I suppose that's what he's worried about. Um, and actually, we thought about him talking a little bit, saying, you know, please don't have my kid now, because I've got two and they're terrible. Um, and I don't want another. But, you know, we would, we, we sort of wanted to, to keep it a surprise that he's got two kids. So therefore, we, we, we couldn't go there. Um, but I, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, this is actually this scene is actually something that happened not to Ruben himself, but to a friend. I think that's a lie. Uh, I think it happened to Ruben, but he just didn't want to say it. Um, but um, so he pretends it happened to a friend. Um, but but that's what he says about it, and and he's actually introduced me to someone that he says it happened to. Um, but but um, so it's actually it's actually something that has happened to someone, perhaps not Ruben, to perhaps perhaps someone else. And the thing there was that he was like dead scared that she would go and get herself pregnant with that thing. Yeah. And now the scene that comes after when she comes to his work and wants to talk to him, mm-hmm. I think that might be my favorite scene in the movie because I I just find the the thank inter- you the interruptions I, that was so much fun to do. Well, tell me about it. The interruptions from the chair. They're having this conversation near an art installation that involves these crashing chairs. So they're trying to have this conversation while they're constantly being interrupted. Mm -hmm. And what was it like just shooting that and sort of getting the rhythm of it right? Well, that scene, I rehearsed with Ruben during almost every lunch break on every day prior to Elizabeth coming uh, to the set. Uh, and we rehearsed and we rehearsed it and uh, forever. And then when she arrived, we sort of started doing improvs of, I mean, obviously he'd written the scene and then we did improvs of not to sort of change it, but to sort of get into this sort of organic, authentic thing. And um, and then we 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 worked on it and, and the thing about that scene scene i mean i mean what i mean he still wanted I mean, in every scene he always wanted christian to sort of be cornered by something be like yeah, and 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 he sort of really achieved that and the fun thing about that scene is that we actually did something like 20 takes of it and then she had to run off to the loo and i said to ruben okay when she comes back i can actually remember her name because uh, in the previous takes i was like I can't remember her name. Um, and then I said to him, let's surprise her when she comes back. Let's, th- I'll just say her name. And that's why the reaction is like so amazing on her side. Because What? <laughs> because she had no idea that we did that. Um, but um, that scene was just amazing to shoot because, I mean, to work with someone like her was... She's such a great actress, and 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 you can just take that scene in every direction, and she just sort of immediately just follows a- anything you want to do. So we had, I mean, we had so many ways of going around it, and I think it must actually have been quite hard editing that thing because there are, there were so many so many magical moments there. And now the the way in which that scene in particular sort of deconstructs. Christian's kind of position of power and the way that he uses that power in picking up women is something that... It's quite Harvey Bernstein, isn't it? Uh, Weinstein, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Burn wine, whatever. Well, but that's that's yeah. what... I mean, when the film played at can, pr- first premiered at Cannes, it seemed very timely and sort of like mm-hmm. an important movie. And it seems like, it, to me, it's so interesting how it's only becoming more topical and more sort of of the moment as it time has gone by, is it surprising to you that that element of the movie in particular is so prescient? Well, I didn't see the whole Weinstein thing coming, so yes, probably. <laughs> um, 
But you know, I actually think it's quite interesting because I suppose there's a reason why that thing is happening right now because it seems that power is attracting somehow and people have been exploiting that forever and I think he shines a light on that in that scene. I wanted to say something before about the scene with the chairs yeah. and everything because actually Ruben was controlling the chairs and the noise in the room with a button and every time he we sort of got to somewhere in the scene where it was totally embarrassing he was just push that button and we were like we can't say anything now and 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 at one point I, I i could just see in her eyes okay now we both know exactly when he's going to push it we got to, we sort of got to a point in the scene every time okay he's going to do it now because now it's really the worst moment ever but um no i didn't i didn't I didn't know that it would be because it's sort of reality has sort of overtaken the film in that sense. I, what he's saying when he's saying, "Why don't you just admit that power is a turn on?" Um, I think he's saying something that has become more truthful than you would know. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And uh, now I have to be sure to ask about the gala scene as as well with the just unbelievable performance from Terry Notari. Oh my goodness. Now, what was it like to simply witness that, to kind of be in the room? It was probably, was you know, it? watching a fellow actor just working to the max. I'm, I'm so in awe of his work and his work ethic. We shot that scene over three days. Um, I think Ruben and him actually rehearsed for one day before that. But we shot it over three days, and we did a total run-through of that scene every time. And it's probably something like 12 or 14 minutes long, and Terry just did it 25 times a day. And, I mean, he just knows his monkeys. I mean, he's amazing in that sense. He just snaps right in, and it's not like he's in that monkey mode all the time. He just, uh, he's just like you and me or anyone. And then Ruben says action and all of a sudden he goes Rrr. And uh, I'm, I'm, I can't, I've, I've never seen anyone work that hard and, and be that precise about what he's doing. I think he was amazing. It was such an inspiration to see that. I know I should be sure to, to ask, do you have any experience with the art world? Like do you, do the, the kind of person that Christian is and the sort of people that he encounters in the art world, do you have any experience with that? No, not in that sense. I'm, I'm totally an art freak myself, so I love to go to museums. And, and what we did for this is I got to interview saw a, a lot of um, museum directors in Denmark and in Sweden. And we transcribed an interview with a Swedish museum director, and I rehearsed that full thing just to get sort of into that way of thinking and talking. Um, but no, I don't have an experience with it myself, no. I know the movie is just so funny. Like, do, do, you f do you feel you were playing to the comedy of it, or? No. I'm not funny in any way. I couldn't tell a joke if you asked me to. Um, but I can actually, I, I think I can, I can do, as, uh, if the situation is like, these situations are really funny. So if you just let yourself go with it, it's gonna, it, the, that's the fun of it. I'm, I'm, I'm not in any way sort of your, Jim Carrey funny, and I love Jim Carrey. It's not to say anything bad about him, but I've got no funny bones at all. Um, but when the situations are written as brilliantly as, as these ones are, if you just allow yourself to go with them, they will turn out funny, and, and people might say that you're funny, but I'm in no way funny. Because it's such a magnificent just physical performance. I mean, the the garbage scene, for example, when you're tearing all that stuff apart. Like, it's just so fun to kind of watch you going through those those movements and, and those gestures. Like, that scene in particular, was that something that you rehearsed for very long? Like no, we didn't, <laughs> we didn't rehearse it, but we shot it forever. We shot that over two nights. We shot the, um, the, two, the, the, the very big one and the, the slightly bigger one on one night. And then we shot, you know, the... That this one, where he's, where they're sort of looking into my, my face, and I remember Ruben saying, "Okay, to really get into this, I think we need, we need to make really, really long takes." And I was like, "Okay, what do you mean? We've been shooting like seven, eight, nine takes till now. Do, do we need to make them longer?" Yes, he said. 
Okay. So what we did on that night, I think we did something like 15 takes, and we shot this digitally, and which means you put a memory card into the into the camera, and you can fit 24 minutes onto a memory card, and we shot 24 minutes every time. So I was just going through the trash, and that rain is like really cold. It's like it was like I was freezing. It was terrible. It was they were prepared. I mean those the 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 the, the stuff that I was going through. So there were no diapers, no needles or anything. But I, I mean rotten fruit and coffee and whatever, what have you. Um, but actually, it was quite fun to do. Um, you sort of get into a mode where you sort of okay, let's just do it. Yeah. And one of the things I find so heartbreaking about the storyline with the with the boy is simply that you keep waiting for Christian to kind of be the adult in the room, to like sort of s get outside of himself, realize it's this boy, and sort of behave accordingly, mm -hmm. but he can never kind of get outside of his own mo his own head and no. the things that he's worried about. That's right. He's, he's even more the child. Um, well, he's had a bad day. He's had a bit, he's had a terrible day. He got sacked. He, this video came out. The monkey dinner, everything went terrible. And um, well, I just think it's so super interesting to sort of let an adult sort of behave in that way. I mean, I just this is one thing that I hope that did not come from me. I hope that I will never throw a kid down the stairs like he does. Um, but you know that kid. He's like, I, I, you probably won't believe it, but he's like Bambi personified. Um, he's like the sweetest kid you ever saw. He's got like these very big eyes. He's so sweet. And the second Ruben said action, he was like <laughs> the devil. I mean, he, he terrorized me and he terrorized the whole set until Ruben said thank you. And he was like, hi, I'm just, he was just so sweet. I just want to adopt him and take him home to Denmark. But, he, but I mean, he was a natural. Um, that was he was so brilliant, um, but it's quite interesting that actually Christian is like actually the child in that scene. Um, but I can actually see why that happens somehow. I mean, I suppose we've all done very stupid things, and if we're in a if we if the pressure is high enough, and and we've I mean we do stupid things, and I. I, s I suppose that's why you can actually relate to Christian, because I, we can all relate to the fact that we've done stupid things in our lives, I suppose. I can. And now, I understand that the when you were at Cannes, when the movie won the Palme d'Or, the top prize, that it essentially became like a scene from a Ruben Ostlin film. And Almost, that yeah. There was a terrible misunderstanding between you and Ruben. On the night that the, the no, there was worked. no un, no 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 misunderstanding, but it was like what happened in Cannes was there was this journalist quite early on in the festival. She started lobbying for me as best actor, and then at the end of the festival, all these predictions came out, and I think in Variety and Hollywood Reporter and Telegraph from London and the Daily Mail or something, they all said that I was going to win for best male actor. And so we went to the the award ceremony, and you only get called to go there if you're going to pick up something. And everybody said to me, okay, you've made a marvelous film, but you're not going to win the big one because it's too funny. A film that funny has never won at Cannes. So I was like, I'm going to win that. Um, I'm gonna. So when they announced Best Male Actor, I was like, I'm ready to get out of my chair. And luckily I didn't, and Joaquin Phoenix did. Um, and then two minutes later, um, we sort of won the Palm Door, and I was like over the moon for like three minutes. And then I was like, what was that? Why did I pick up that award? And then I went to the party, and when you go to that party in Cannes, it's like the most amazing thing you ever saw. Uh, people are dressed like you've never seen it. Um, there's champagne. There's so much champagne, you can't believe it. You're, you're, you're on a beach, and they've sort of transported the most posh restaurant from Paris to Cannes. The food is amazing. Everything is amazing. And I was just getting really pissed talking to my agents and saying, I'm really, really mad that I didn't get this uh, award for me. And then when Ruben came back from the press conference, I, I saw him across the room, and I thought, I'm 
going to kill him. He stole my award, that little Swedish wanker. I'm just going to f- tear him apart. And then I said to my wife, we need to leave now. Um, because I, I've done really, really stupid things when I was drunk. So I knew that I was capable of probably doing something really terrible there. So I went back to my flat, which was like probably 200 meters away from, from the Palais. And I just sat there with a glass of c- Coke and watched the fireworks. <laughs> and, and it was terrible, yeah. But I walked away and I, I, I was like, I'm going to tear that prize apart and get half of it because it's mine. I know it's terrible. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to tell this story as many times as I can to sort of confess. <laughs> sorry. Well, I, I think you, uh, you have every right to feel that you deserve a prize of some sort. No, I don't. Listen. Listen, the, the movie got that amazing prize, and I'm quite proud to say that I actually think that I play a part in it, and that's enough now. It's over. It's fine. I'm good now. But on that evening, it was terrible. My wife was mad with me because she was like, are we really going to leave this party? I mean... We just you just won the Palm Door. Everybody's here is waiting everybody is waiting to talk to you and, and I said we need to leave. I'm gonna kill him. Well that is where we will take our leave here tonight. Please everyone join me in thanking Clay's Bang. Thank you.